morning. So um, I'd like to start out my talk by offering an alternative. Um, I was asked to speak about bulbar management in motor neuron disease and um, I'm going to start by offering an alternative heading to that which is lessons learned from superheroes in considering the management of bulbar symptoms in, in, in MND. Um, and the reasons for that will become obvious as I move forward. So bulbar symptoms, we've heard a little bit about bulbar symptoms this morning and what, what are we actually talking about? We're talking about um, changes to sp the muscles and nerves that we use for speech and swallowing. And the reason that they're referred to bulb as bulbar symptoms are because of the similarity to in the, sh in the shape of that part of the brain stem where these nerves pass through, um, it looks like a bulb. So we're familiar now with the uh, phenotype model. We do, some people experience bulbar symptoms as their first symptom, as we heard um, from Maria this morning. Um, but what we also know is that regardless of where people experience their first symptoms, most people will have experienced some degree of change to their speech or swallowing at some point in their disease trajectory. So just, um, I'm going to take you on a little journey with the clinician. Um, so as clinicians and as speech pathologists, we start out as mild-mannered humans with um, an enthusiasm for our fellow man and a, a desire to help and support people. Um, as speech pathologists, we enter into university and we get um, given our skills, our, our expertise, we get uh, a lot of training in the areas of communication and swallowing. Um, also, one of the things that we have to swallow all day, every day, is saliva and secretion. So we get some knowledge and, and skills and training regarding that. And we do also get a little bit in oral health because changes to the muscles that you use for speech and swallowing can impact on your oral health. And your oral health can also impact on those things. So at the end of our university degree, we're ready to launch into the world and help others. We're loaded with a whole stack of skills and training and ideas and we enter the workforce. If it's pretty quickly you realise that you actually need help. So you need, if you're lucky, you work with other speech pathologists who are, are more <laughs> skilled than yourself and your training really has just started. And more often than not, throughout your experience as a clinician, you feel like the little guy at the bottom. You're surrounded by others with more expertise and knowledge than yourself, and you benefit and your learning benefits greatly from that, and we're able to pass that on to the people that we're working to support. Equally quickly, you realise that you benefit from the knowledge and skills um, of others who have different training, different superpowers. Um, you know, whether that's OTs, physios, dietitians, from a speech pathology point of view. So who makes up Bethlehem's Justice League? We're very fortunate at Bethlehem. We have a very diverse um, team that is, has a full range of allied health. We have a, a full range of medical specialists, um, nursing specialists. We work with, we've got dentists coming in, res um, respiratory specialists, and we're very, very fortunate. And we really appreciate that, and we appreciate that not everyone um, every speech pathologist working in the community has access to that. Access to that. So we do work hard to share that um, knowledge and that support. The principles, um, we work within a neuropalliative rehabilitation framework, which basically means we get all the benefits of neurology, rehabilitation and palliative care and that we're able to ensure that we offer those advantages to the people that we support. And hopefully the people we support get what they need as they need it. Um, this impacts our decision making. It's, for us, it's not just about safety, but equally important is quality of life. And we try to negotiate a balance for that. Um, we try to ensure that people un are un understand what's happening and can be comfortable with the changes that are happening or as comfortable as possible. We endeavour to minimise risk and we try to empower individuals to self-refer, so to help people to understand what's happening, what to look for, and when to um, contact us. 
So from a speech pathology point of view, I'll just talk about our particular superpowers um, and saliva management and mouth care. So swallowing difficulties or dysphagia, as it's, as it's termed, um, if you think about most meal times, they involve some level of socialisation. So impact, things that impact on your ability to swallow can have a big impact on your ability to socialise and um, social interactions and people find that it impacts on their ability to in engage with friends and family and, and so it can have it quite dramatic effects. And it can contribute significantly to that sense of loss and of hope and control. The sorts of symptoms to look for are things like coughing, throat clearing, choking, loss of weight, um, changes to how you manage at meal times, as it taking longer, um, and changes to what you like to eat. But equally, sometimes the symptoms are quite silent. Things can be changing and it's not as overt as people coughing every time they eat or drink. Our assessment involves interviews with patients and families. We observe people at meal times and when they're swallowing. Um, and not just at meal times. You swallow all day, every day. So um, we're also looking at what's happening every time we're with you. And this formal assessment of function of what's happening with these muscles. And like superheroes, speech pathologists also have x-ray vision. So um, we run a video clinic that enables us to take x-rays of people when they're swallowing so that we can really see what's happening and match that with what we've learned from the person. Um, we just had some Melbourne Uni um, students working with us at, on a project and, and the information that came out of that really reinforced, particularly for um, people with bulbar onset motor neuron disease, the benefits of doing that sort of assessment. Um, and that was because we found that 50% um, of the videos that we looked at, people with um, had silent, what we call silent aspiration. So things were going the wrong way and there was no overt sign of that. We could only really see it on video. So that's changed um, our thinking and our management um, to some degree. Intervention involves education. Um, one of the... Swallowing is such a finely honed thing. You do it all day, every day without thinking about it. The disadvantage of that is small changes can have a big impact. The advantage of that is minor changes to what you do when you're swallowing can push things back the other way and make it more comfortable and safe. Our aim, um, management is quite varied. Our aim is comfort, enjoyment and control and safety. We work collaboratively with um, other, special, other team members like dietitians, physio, um, OT, and we aim to minimise the challenges and the risks. Um, we teach choking management for people if their choking is part of what's happening for their disease, we actually teach them how to um, respond to that and manage that. Uh, we manage nutrition, so um, we work collaboratively with dietitians to minimise weight loss. Um, and we make help make decision, people make decisions about alternative um, forms of nutrition like tube feeding. As I said, one of the things that we also have to swallow is saliva and we make anywhere from 600 mils to a litre and a half of saliva a day. Um, saliva is a very important part of our well-being and our health. So impairments to how we manage that can have dramatic effects across a range of areas and can be quite um, an anxiety provoking symptom of the disease. Assessment again is, is quite um, diverse and broad reaching um, and we're looking at things like the, um, how much saliva do people have, what colour is it, what consistency and what the pattern of that is across the day. We also look at other things like um, is, is the per, has the person got a chest infection? Are they in an acute, experience an acute issue that might be impacting on their saliva management? Because your management at times like that is quite different to what it needs to be when you're just in the normal phase of the disease. And we look at a whole range of other things that impact on that. Our management, again, is very broad. It's not just about medications. Medications and working with the doctors is a component of that. But we have a whole range of other strategies that we invariably educate people about and um, we'll trial with them. And it is, as Maria said, there is a lot of trial and error. There are certain things you can do for certain things, but 
indivi each individual have their own sort of particular um, pattern and what they benefit from. As I said, oral hygiene can be something that um, speech pathology also works um, to help people manage. Um, we work closely with OTs and physios and nursing to address that and we work with dentists and um, the you know, uh, dental hospital, the public dental health system to sort of try and identify um, particular challenges for people and to help people be in the best possible place to manage that. The other sort of broad area that speech pathologists work in is communication. Um, and at university, we, earn, we learn about the whole broad spectrum of communication. For us here today, we're really only talking about a small part of that. We're talking about this management of the speech symptoms. So assessment, again, is, is quite broad and individualised. Um, and we'll often talk to the carer as well as the person. The, mani the management of the, or the strategies we put in place fall into four broad sort of um, areas. So sort of particularly early on in the, in the condition, but again, each of these sort of um, sets of strategies might be used at varying stages. But we aim to optimise people's speech intelligibility. And we might talk to communication partners about what they can do to make things easier. And we might, often what we find is we might need to address a particular context. Telephone use, for instance, is an area that people often report particular challenges with. Um, we talk to people about fatigue management. And sometimes, particularly in the earlier stages of the disease, we might talk to people about things like voice banking, which in reality belongs in the high technology arena at this point. But um, requires um, reasonable voice in the earlier stages and video legacy work to address some of the communication challenges. Low tech options include things like pen and paper, write and white boards, ABC and fixed message boards, eye transfer boards. And what we find is that um, in the earlier stages of speech changes, pe people might resort to some of these occasionally. It's not the case that people were using it all the time, but just at particular times when they have challenges, they might draw on some of this. But these, some of these tools might also be used in the later stages by someone who's moved into a high tech device. They might also use some of these things as part of their system. Communication hybrids involve using part of your natural communication skill, but it's augmented by technology. A bit like Iron Man's suit, augmented his natural abilities. So we're looking at things like, um, we have electric access to electric e-trans, voice amplifiers, you're using your voice, you're just augmenting it and making it stronger, um, and things like laser pointers. And like superheroes, we now have access to some wonderful high technology. And being part of a team like Bethlehem, we, we've been able to sort of draw a lot of funds and fundraising support to get access to a lot of that technology. Um, and it's been quite an, a, a, a great opportunity for those of us working there. So we have dedicated communication devices, so things that are built for communication, like light writers up in the top corner where you type into it and it speaks out. We have mainstream devices like iPads that can be, have um, communication apps added to them that enable them to be used for communication. And then we have um, adapted mouse controls that enable people to use their computers without hand function and use communication apps and eye um, gaze communication boards. Uh, this picture here is about NeuroNode, which is um, a switch that uses muscle potentials and we're working with the team that are looking at developing the brain controlled switch. So there are some exciting opportunities that come as being part of a team at, like Bethlehem. But I thought I'd, to give you, for those of you who haven't seen anyone using um, eye gaze communication, I thought I'd let someone with, who use, has used the device tell you a little bit about it. So bear with me as we try to get this to Hi, I'm Roxanne. I'm one of the speech pathologists from Calvary Health. The device that she uses to support her communication and the impact that's had on her life. So over to you, Ange.
Angie Cunningham. I am a wife and mother of two girls. I was diagnosed with MND when I was 39, nearly four years ago. I lost my ability to speak in the first year and used an iPad to communicate. When I lost the use of my hands, this eye gaze machine has been my absolute savior. I get very frustrated without it. My husband and I believe it is the most valuable of all the equipment we have. It is a bit slower than normal but it gives me the opportunity to be still me. I can still do a lot of things independently with this eye gaze machine which is amazing. I do emails and do the grocery shopping online. I have written a book for my little girls and even arranged their birthday parties, invites and all. So, um, like superheroes, the technology is enabling people to do amazing things. Um, and if you know, it wasn't me using that. It was, and I feel that um, the clinicians are probably a bit more like Batman's butler or Gwyneth Paltrow for Iron Man. Like we know about the technology and we support the people using the technology, but we're not the ones using it. Which, um, and I'd like to reflect. Uh, I suppose the other thing I'd like to say about the high tech stuff is even what we're finding, even the most competent users still find there are frustrating elements to their communication. And as a speech pathologist, one of the things that we can do is, for those users, is really um, look at what are the remaining challenges for their communication, what strategies could be put in place and built around that um, device use to enable it to um, be more effective form of communication for them. So there, there is a, a role that's sort of a bit bigger than just being able to be a, type, a fast typist. Um, reflecting for a moment on the qualities of a superhero, in most superhero action films, the superhero does not straight away become powerful, strong or brave. It usually happens after a significant event. They never give up, they cherish life, they, they're brave in the face of adversity. They help others and are kind and selfless. And we've heard a little bit about that this morning, which really points us to the true superhero of the, the story here, which is not the clinician, but the people themselves, the people living with these conditions. Um, the other message I hope has come across this morning is the importance of collaboration. And um, as a clinician, we seek opportunities for collaboration. I really would strongly advocate for people living with the condition and their carers to look for collaborative partners in, in their journey with the condition as well. Think about who are your just, who's your Justice League. It'll be your carers, family, friends. It'll be your local community support services. So it might be a local speech pathologist, whether they're um, attached to a community centre or attached or you're getting them through NDIS, um, local specialist support providers, but they're also us. We work very in a shared care arrangement with a lot of people, providing our um, expertise and experience. You know, a lot of our knowledge has been gained from the people that we work with, and we're really just conduits for passing on that information. Um, and I would really encourage people because I th to look for opportunities to create um, and allow some of their partners to collaborate with each other. The funding streams are often set up to have your speech pathologist seeing you by themselves, the dietitian seeing by themselves. There's a lot of benefit to enabling the opportunities for those two people to come together and work collaboratively with you um, and for you. They don't need to do it all the time, but just occasionally so there's that real sense of team and, and you'll, the benefits you'll get from that sort of thing are, um, are untold. Uh, and so that's where I'd like to finish for the moment.